Well, good morning. Glad to see you, all of us here together again today for the last session. That look familiar? I'm good. Obey the rules and believe certain things. God will admit me into heaven when I die. That sound familiar? Yes. So, if I do this, I get that. Good and strong ball. And we call that salvation. More recently, I've uh, considered a different way to think about the same thing. In Mark, if anyone wants to be a follower of mine, let him renounce himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It doesn't say anything about what happens after you die. This is what happens while you are here with us and still alive. In John, it says, In all truth I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born through the water, through water and the Spirit. Do not be surprised when I say, you must be born from above. So again, nothing after we die. It's all about here and now. And finally again in John, I give you a new commandment. Love one another. You must love one another even as I have loved you. Now, we remember the two great commandments, the Shema, God is one, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and strength. And then the second is from, that's from Deuteronomy, and the second one's from Leviticus, and it says, love your neighbor as yourself. So what do you suppose Jesus is talking about here with a new commandment? We've already been given a long time before Love your neighbor as yourself. So what is the difference? What's this new commandment? How is it different than the one that we had all along? Have you got any thoughts? Even as I have loved you, he says. Say that again, Pastor. Even as, even as Jesus has loved his... Even as I have loved you. Right, that's exactly right. So there's something about the way Jesus loved us, his friends, that he called friends, and this the context of this passage is the Last Supper. And he said, you are my friends. So that's the new commandment, even as I have loved you, which is, what kind of love? What are we talking about? Well, he gave his life. He gave his life. So, so it's unconditional. Unconditional and without limit. So that's, that's a new commandment that goes beyond what Leviticus would have told us. So let's move from that into stewardship. Resources. And if Nicolette was here, she would be using words like, that sound familiar? We usually hear that when there's a pledge card in the picture. Uh, but what we're talking about really doesn't have anything to do with treasure. That's really a great way to think about stewardship. And I'm not saying anything other than think about stewardship as time, talent, and treasure. But I'd like to go to a broader meaning And that is, what is a steward? I mean, we talk about stewardship. What is a steward? Manager. manager. It is a manager. And if we look at the word steward, it comes from the term sty warden. And a sty warden was a person who kept animals for meat. I mean, we all know about pig styes, right? So. It's just an enclosure that you keep animals. But the catch is, and it's already been said, it's a manager of someone else's property. It's not our own animals we're taking care of. Steward takes care of 
things that belong to someone else. So, to whom do all things belong? God, God created all things, so they're all, all of God's things. Very good. God. So the true owner of all that is, is God. And we are therefore dependent on the Creator. And yet, God has given us charge over the earth and the ability to preserve or waste things. I mean, we think of material things that we're in charge of, but it's also time. So, that leaves us with the conclusion that stewardship is pretty much inescapable. We are stewards all the time, essentially over everything. And we can look at examples, all sorts of examples. This is a short list, but it could be much longer. Clergy and vestries, we entrust them with the well-being of our church. President and Congress is there presumably to keep us safe. Military and police do similar things. So we have this list of even down to babysitters. We leave our kids with someone, they're not their kids, but they're there to take care of the kids when we're not around. And there's lots of parables, aren't there, of Jesus talking about stewardship, about, uh, I think, the parable of the pounds. The king went away, and he left ten with this one, and five with that one, and one with another one, to take care of. It wasn't their stuff, but they, it was for them to take care of. So what do we look for in a steward? Responsibility. Responsibility. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Honesty. Honesty. Sounds judgment. I didn't hear that one. Sound judgment. Sound judgment, yes. Another parable. The Lord asked, who then is the wise and trustworthy steward whom the master will place over his household to give them at the proper time their allowance of food? So the steward, back in Old Test or New Testament times, one of their jobs was to divvy out the food. Who gets what to eat? A pretty important job. Uh, blessed that servant if his master arrived uh, Master's arrival finds him doing exactly that. I tell you, he would put him in charge of everything that he owns. Now, if we went on, there's the other side of that corn coin. What if the master arrives and the steward is not doing? That? You can imagine. So, trustworthy, wise, integrity, honesty, that's what we're looking for. So, of what are we stewards? So stewardship comes down to, it's about how we live our life. Um, there's lots of choices, and depending on those choices, so we move on. After Jesus was baptized, he returned home. So Jesus came to Nazareth. This was uh, right after John the Baptist was arrested. So Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day as he usually did. And I think that's interesting, as he usually did. That means Jesus must have skipped Sabbath from time to time. But he was usually there. He stood up to read, and they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. 
He has sent me to proclaim, release the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Um, try that again. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. Okay, good. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim a year of the Lord's favor. So he is essentially saying, and, and if we go on from there, that that prophecy is fulfilled in himself. Um, so if the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, has anointed me, he says, I'm the Messiah. But then he goes on to give a list of things that he claims is his to do. And notice how we are slipping from stewardship into mission. This is what Jesus claims, among other things, he is here to do. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim a year of the Lord's favor. So he starts to give us a list. The church has come up with its own list, sort of an updating of the list. And they call it the five marks of mission. And the first one is to proclaim the good news to the kingdom, to all, presumably. To teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. To respond to human need with loving service. To seek to transform unjust structures of society. And to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain a renew and renew life on earth. Going back to scripture in Matthew 25, after a long dissertation on um, how we did or didn't feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and visit the prisoners, and um, help the sick, and so forth. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. So, scriptural roots for mission. Um, Matthew 16, Matthew 6. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And again in Matthew. Uh, the feeding of the 5,000 we talked about last week. Uh, we looked at the scarcity in terms of material. There was only five loaves and two fish. Not a lot to feed 5,000 people. Jesus doesn't speak of material. He speaks of uh, spirit and abundance that comes from a spiritual approach. And as I mentioned before, parable of the talents, where the king went away and gave one ten, one five, and one one to do with, and the five and the ten, they increased certain fold. The one was buried, and that person did not make out too good. Uh, remember the parable of the rich fool. These are all readings that we've had not too long ago uh, out of the lectionary. Um, the rich fool who had a huge harvest and he had so much he didn't know what to do with, wouldn't fit into his barn, so he said, I'm going to tear down all my barns and build new big ones. And I'll put in my harvest in the barns and I can live easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And God says, yeah, except for one thing. Uh, I'm going to call for your life tonight. And then whose will all this belong to? Paul in 2 Corinthians. To the needy he gave without stint. His uprightness stands firm forever. We're all given spiritual gifts. Paul in 1 Corinthians outlines nine of them. He says there's a variety of gifts. 
Uh, to one is given the utterance of wisdom, another knowledge, another faith, another healing, another the working of miracles and prophecy, discernment of spirits, various kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. But every everyone is given a spiritual gift or many spiritual gifts even. The question is, what do we do with them? An updating of that list is offer in love what you already love to do. Offer in hope what you feel called to do. And offer in willingness that which needs to be done. Now, we offer in love what we already love to do. That's almost kind of easy, isn't it? We offer in hope what we feel called to do. The call is not, I mean, the call is sort of a nagging thing. The call is something that, yeah, we ought to do, but we really don't feel like it, you know? Um, but the call is persistent. It doesn't go away. And in offering willingness what needs to be done. And that's a little bit harder. So you see, it starts easy and then it gets a little bit more difficult. Um, and the rewards, what comes back, is the same. Is the same as it gets harder, the rewards get greater. Um, so, spiritual gifts. How many people here serve in the liturgy, either as a lector or um, Eucharistic minister, verger, uh, altar guild, choir, I have no choir. So, if this is not something you do presently, you might think about I mean, what could be better? And, and my own experience is um, to interact with people that come up for either bread or wine and to make that eye contact, it's, it's an amazing experience, it really is. And of course, we do a lot beyond the church itself. Um, it's not like, okay, I'm a lector, therefore I'm done. <laughs> or I'm a Eucharistic minister, so I did my bit. No, that's not it. Uh, there is service beyond the church, and we do an awful lot of that, but there's always room for more. So, what have we done? We've talked about what a steward is, what stewardship is in a, in a broader context than just time, talent, and treasure. We looked at what scripture tells us about stewardship and about mission. We looked at the five marks of mission and the spiritual gifts that we are all given by God. And I thank you all for your attention and your time and being here. And